Okay. Yeah, please start when, whenever you're ready. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, Victor, for the introduction. Uh, and thanks, Alvaro, and all the organizers for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's been interesting to see all the other talks. Um, so I'll be talking today mostly about uh, algorithms for tensor computations, as well as software libraries targeted at massively parallel uh, tensor operations. Uh, so uh, I'll be talking about primarily work that's been done as part of my research group at the, the computer science department in the University of Illinois. We work uh, at the intersection of applied math, specifically numerical linear algebra and numerical optimization, uh, computer science, so specifically parallel algorithms, communication cost analysis, uh, and uh, kind of software libraries, uh, and uh, also quantum. Uh, so we uh, kind of, I've, I've done a lot of work in quantum chemistry. Uh, and tensor kind of tensor methods for quantum chemistry, uh, and we also think a bit about uh, quantum computing and quantum algorithms and how to simulate such systems. So we think about a, a few different types of quantum. Uh, so most of the work I will present today is fairly general and applies uh, to many applications of tensor methods. So I'll uh, start with a short introduction, then talk about tensor contractions, so how to multiply tensors together, then tensor decompositions, how to break them apart, uh, and then talk a little bit about uh, software automation for uh, methods for, for, for tensors. So uh, a tensor is a collection of elements. In a sense, you can think about it as a multidimensional array. Uh, and in, in thinking about a tensor, we usually have in mind some algebraic operations. Uh, so just to establish some terminology, I'll refer to dimensions as matrix dimensions. So, so uh, kind of the, the sizes of the modes of, of the tensor, where a mode of the tensor is like one index. Uh, so kind of one way of a matrix. Um, and I'll refer to the order as the number of modes, the number of indices. Uh, as opposed to the dimension, because that's confusing relative to vector and matrix dimension. Uh, and so here on the right are also uh, little uh, kind of diagrams that can be used to express order one, order two, or order three tensors. I will not use too much diagrams today. Uh, so an order zero tensor is a scalar, an order one tensor is a vector, and an order two tensor is a matrix. Uh, and we'll use kind of bold font calligraphic notation to denote the tensor itself, and uh, plain font uh, with indices to determine to denote a tensor element. Uh, so a tensor contraction uh, describes some way of combining two tensors by matching up their modes and summing over some subset of them. Uh, basic matrix operations and vector operations, such as inner products, outer products, matrix vector, matrix matrix products are examples of tensor contractions. Uh, but uh, with tensor contractions, we often have in mind something higher order. Uh, a simple one is tensor times matrix, where we multiply the tensor by a matrix along one mode, and the result is a tensor. Uh, so tensor contractions uh, are prevalent in quantum chemistry methods, such as coupled cluster, uh, and are kind of widely studied in, in, in application uh, uh, to such methods. So which was also my uh, kind of first introduction to tensors and was the driver for initial work I've done on tensor contractions. Um, so uh, first, uh, let's think a little bit about what a what kind of a tensor contraction maps to uh, from the point of view of linear algebra. Uh, if we consider a, kind of a, a basic form a basic general form of a tensor contraction. One could slightly generalize this, but this generally is suffices. Uh, we might have S plus T output indices. So S plus T, uh, an order S plus T tensor that's, con that's uh, constructed by contracting over V indices, these K indices here. Uh, and so no matter our choices of how big these index groups are, S, T, and V, we can always uh, kind of reduce this tensor contraction to a matrix matrix product. Uh, by simply combining uh, each group of indices into one big index. Uh, so this means that if we want to do tensor contractions, we really mostly just have to do matrix multiplication. Uh, but the complications may arise in that our data may not be ordered in the way that we actually want for the particular matrix multiplication. Uh, so this is a challenge for kind of uh, from a parallel computing point of view when data is distributed, but also locally uh, due to the need for transposition or some other way of contracting with the data in place. Uh, uh, but also, tensors can make the problem interesting if they have symmetries. Uh, and that's something that we'll talk about next in some detail. So uh, a symmetric tensor uh, is defined so that each permutation of its modes uh, yields the same element. Uh, so I'll refer to kind of a symmetric tensor as just this for an arbitrary order symmetric tensor. Of course, there's other types of symmetries. Uh, we can, for example, consider skew symmetry where we switch the sign. We can consider partial symmetries where only some subsets of the indices can be interchanged uh, to yield the same elements. Uh, and I'll also separately talk about group symmetries, which uh, can be expressed somewhat differently as a block sparsity uh, structure inside the tensor. 
Uh, a simple example of a symmetric tensor contraction is a matrix vector product with a symmetric matrix. And immediately we also see that it's kind of interesting. So uh, there's opportunities from a computational point of view. We can uh, leverage the fact that we can only store half of the entries of the matrix more or less uh, to save on memory, memory footprint and potentially on communication cost. Uh, and we can leverage the fact that, uh, and we can try to leverage the fact that we're multiplying the same element of A by elements of X. However, it's not obvious how to do that because we're multiplying a given element of A by two different elements of X. So it's symmetric reflection will get multiplied by a different element. So typically this operation is as expensive in terms of the number of oper operations as a matrix vector product. Um, so we proposed a way to reorganize uh, symmetric tensor contractions of this type, except for arbitrary order, in a way that reduces the number of uh, multiplications, so scalar multiplications, at the cost of doing more additions. In a sense, we kind of symmetrize uh, our inputs A and B uh, so that the overall set of products we compute is fully symmetric, uh, and we then compute a partial sum of that, uh, and this includes some terms we don't want. Sorry about that. But all those terms can be computed with uh, low order. So um, I'll kind of won't go into the details today, but you, you can refer to our paper for more. So this provides a, a computational advantage, not really for the typical case when you have a kind of real entries in the tensor uh, and uh, kind of each entry is just a scalar, uh, because we are doing more additions per multiply. But this provides a computational advantage if you're working with a complex tensor, or if each element is actually itself uh, some kind of uh, matrix or block or another tensor even. Uh, and in, you can think of partially symmetric tensors in this way. So if you have two disjoint symmetry groups, you have a symmetric tensor of symmetric tensors. Um, and so you can apply this algorithm in such settings in a nested way to reduce computational cost. Because in such a setting, uh, these scalar additions, which are no longer of scalars, uh, are much uh, more, much less expensive than scalar multiplies, again, because the scalars now become uh, kind of a tensor. So we see the benefit of that here on the right plot where we actually outperform uh, kind of the standard approach to doing a partially symmetric tensor contraction here expressed as a nested matrix matrix multiply uh, with one pair of matrices being symmetric. Uh, so there we achieve something like a 4.5x speed up out of a theoretical possible of six. Um, there is however uh, overheads to these types of algorithms. Uh, and actually to generally using a symmetric packed format, which means only storing uh, uh, the unique elements of a tensor. Uh, when considering kind of communication costs, uh, especially in a distributed memory setting. So we've done uh, theoretical work that has analyzed how much communication is needed to perform tensor contractions uh, if you use symmetric packed storage, uh, and if you employ these types of algorithms that I just showed you, which can potentially be more com uh, com computationally efficient. Uh, and in fact, we've, shown, we've found that surprisingly in some scenarios, they require asymptotically more communication cost, uh, namely for certain contractions. And sorry, I should uh, explain what I mean by communication cost. I mean the amount of data movement that uh, uh, is needed to execute the algorithm in terms of uh, how much data we need to move between a memory and the level of a cache hierarchy, or the amount of data that we need to move between processors that are in distributed memory system. So essentially the main two things we care about in, in getting an algorithm to be efficient. How efficient is it in terms of memory bandwidth on node and how efficient is it in terms of communication between processing elements as we scale up the algorithm? So uh, because kind of these symmetry preserving tensor contraction algorithms require additions of many elements per multiply, they turn out to have a more kind of more well-connected dependency structure that can sometimes asymptotically uh, increase communication costs. However, those cases are kind of weird contractions. You have to be high order and, and you have to, have to have different numbers of contracted or uncontracted modes. If that's not the case, everything is actually okay, according to our analysis so far. Um, these lower bounds are actually kind of more general. We've derived them for the general framework of bilinear algorithms and applied them also to fast matrix multiplication algorithms, such as Strassen's algorithm, uh, as well as to uh, fast convolutional algorithms. Um, okay, so that's what I wanted to say in terms of uh, this type of permutational symmetry in tensors. Next, I want to talk a little bit about uh, group symmetry, uh, where we now have uh, tensors such that uh, uh, if some set of indices satisfies uh, certain kind of cyclic equations, uh, then the block can be considered to be zero. At least this is kind of one way in which we can uh, view this problem. Uh, this can be thought of with the assumption that each block is of the same size or that we padded it to be the same size, which is not always true in applications, but is sometimes true. Um, in electronic structure, I think it is uh, supposed to be reason a reasonable assumption. Um, 
we can think about such a block sparse tensor by thinking about a tensor of twice the order, so twice as many indices, where I'll use a lowercase index to denote the part of the index that's kind of within a block that's non-symmetric, and the uppercase index to be kind of our block index that satisfies a certain uh, conservation law, so a symmetry rule. So uh, we've been thinking about ways to try to work with such block symmetries in a way that's uh, general and doesn't require uh, uh, kind of systems overhead to handle uh, all, all, all kind of coordination of blocks and specific implementations of symmetries. Um, to do so, we've kind of worked with a form of these tensors that is a, expressed in terms of a reduced tensor. Uh, here, it's reduced in the sense that it's missing one block index, so it's smaller and only storing the unique part of the data. Uh, uh, or the non-zero part of the data in this model. Uh, and the Kronecker delta tensor, which is kind of a, a tensor that is in a sense going to be one if we satisfy the conservation law and zero otherwise. So this somehow encodes our symmetry and allows us to create this J index. So algebraically, this uh, full tensor that we're interested in working with that has the symmetry is represented as a contraction of this a sparse identity-like tensor uh, and the tensor that actually contains the data that is our reduced form. Uh, it's well known that such a reduced form can be constructed, and one also has a degree of freedom in which form you construct. So I could have uh, kind of hidden the J index, the I index, the B index, and the A index. And that matters if we're going to contract this tensor over a given subset of indices with another. Um, so when doing a contraction between such two uh, uh, group symmetric tensors, uh, the classical approach is to implement a set of nested loops uh, and determine the block index uh, uh, by evaluating the symmetry formulas. And so here we took a contraction that should have had a cost that scales uh, uh, as uh, kind of n to the six and g to the six, where g is the size of uh, this uh, group. Uh, but it, this loop nest we can quickly see is order g to the fourth instead of g to the six. So we're in the innermost loop with a contraction over the non-symmetric block, so the, the small block. Um, so. The issue is that kind of this, this code is taking is somewhat difficult to parallelize, right? So in a sense, we need to somehow uh, index into different blocks, and we uh, need to do that in a way that's specific to the, the symmetry formula that's being used, and they can be somewhat different. Uh, however, there has been work in the quantum chemistry community, uh, going back to uh, a paper by Stan Gauss, Watson, uh, Bartlett in 91, uh, on the direct product decomposition that tries to um, construct a reduced form that somehow foregoes the need to think about a kind of the step of block sparsity uh, directly. Um, it's also been recently generalized by Devin Matthews. Um, however, in both of these papers, kind of group theory is used, and there is not really an explicit statement of the algorithm or kind of an algebraic form of it, which is kind of what we came up with largely independently. Uh, so the way that we are expressing uh, uh, so what we're proposing is a way to construct a reduced form that is in a sense aligned, which should match what kind of the group theory is suggesting. Uh, but we want to do that in pure kind of tensor uh, algebraic language, uh, which also makes it easy to implement and automate and, and to understand. Uh, and so what we propose is that to, if we want to consider a contraction, and we kind of state this for general contraction, but here I will just work with order four contractions for simplicity. General isn't really harder. Uh, and we consider some given reduced form of one tensor. So here are you for the reduced form of you uh, with a little bar on top uh, and this chronic or delta tensor that encodes the symmetry of you. And so this tensor may be somewhat slightly different depending on our symmetry uh, and this delta V that goes symmetry on V. So what we've shown is that if you consider the contraction of just these chronic or delta tensors, uh, for any type of kind of chronic or delta tensor, you can re-decompose those using actually what's known as a CP decomposition, which I'll come back to later, uh, and uh, kind of decouple these indices. And this, is, this can be thought of as, uh, if you look at this diagram, which represents our tensor with the four legs being the four indices, that's kind of introducing an intermediate uh, index uh, and then re-expressing the tensor in terms of that index. So here, we, the modes that are actually being stored, so that it will be part of the reduced form, uh, are assigned arrows. So here, A, Q, and J uh, are assigned. Uh, and so to achieve this, we need to transform this reduced form R bar to R. But that's uh, kind of quite possible by essentially contraction with the Kronecker delta tensors, which is uh, really just a mix, uh, kind of mixes up the data a, a little bit and does no real computation. Uh, so these new reduced forms are then expressed with this Q index, which is the one we introduced by the CPD composition. Uh, and after that, it turns out that everything is aligned. And this 
operation that we need to do uh, actually looks like a batch matrix matrix product. So we can actually implement this via tensor contraction library uh, uh, without issue. And we can interpret this in terms of kind of diagrams uh, by combining two tensors with this introduced Q index um, and kind of observing that the, the diagram kind of makes sense in terms of the, the conservation law and, and the flow. Uh, and so, so this is kind of a diagrammatic way of viewing this algorithm. So we provide both a diagrammatic and a kind of a plain algebraic derivation in this reference if you're interested. Um, so the point is that we can kind of now automate uh, the uh, handling of group symmetries, pro provided that the group symmetric blocks are roughly the same in the case of abelian group symmetries that can be reduced to the cyclic group. So here we compare our implementation of this uh, uh, as part of SimTensor uh, based on a BLAS backend and based on a, a CTF backend. CTF is a Cyclops tensor framework, which I'll also talk about shortly, and that provides us kind of somewhat better parallelism. Uh, and right, so we compare on one processor and 64 processes uh, and measure the execution time for a few contractions from couple cluster with kind of reasonably chosen uh, symmetry size and block sizes. Uh, playing matrix multiplication, contractions of uh, matrix product states needed for DMRG, uh, and contractions for PEPs needed for uh, time evolution. So these are common methods for tensor networks and a couple of clusters, of course, are common for quantum chemistry. And we see in all cases that we get fairly robust performance with the new approach as opposed to looping over blocks. So sequentially looping over blocks is about as fast as what we do, maybe usually a, sometimes slower, sometimes faster by a little bit, uh, while when we go and run things in parallel, and if we do looping over blocks and just parallelize each block contraction by say MKL, then the performance we get is this teal bar. And as we see, the teal bar is often a lot worse than the performance we get by this uh, kind of algebraic method that expressed everything in terms of tensor contractions. Um, so programmatically, we've reduced the handling of group symmetries on a contraction to working with dense reduced tensors and an implicit kind of sparse tensor that's its chronic or delta tensor that's often quite small and cheap to apply. Uh, so at contraction time, we are then aligning the tensors to, uh, to doing the direct product decomposition in a sense by contracting with this chronic or delta tensors, uh, chronic or delta tensor that represents the symmetry. Um, and this allows us, uh, this has allowed us to construct um, a library that uh, completely automates the handling of such symmetries, and so the user can, can write code uh, that is oblivious uh, to the specific group symmetry and kind of works with the order four tensor in a sense instead of this order eight tensor with the additional uh, in, uh, block indices. Um, yeah, so that's what I wanted to say on the side of algorithms for tensor contractions. Uh, let me go on, now go on to talk a little bit about uh, the system side. So since several years, um, now it should be about 10, uh, maybe even more. Um, we've been developing what's known as the Cyclops tensor framework, which uh, perform started as a, uh, in a sense, a dense tensor algebra, uh, distributed memory dense tensor algebra library, primarily targeted a couple of cluster type of applications, but now also has support for sparse tensors uh, and for kind of generalized operations, not just times and plus, but potentially other functions on your tensor elements. And this enables it to be kind of like a multidimensional array programming language and has allowed us to connect to other applications. At its base, it's in C++ and uh, relies on MPI for the, as a primary source of parallelism and always distributes tensors over MPI. And it's kind of targeting supercomputing uh, uh, type uh, architectures. Uh, it's been integrated into multiple quantum chemistry packages, including PySCF, uh, QCAM, and CC4S, a couple cluster for solids. Uh, and it's been used for separately uh, by, by a team of, of scientists at IBM and Lawrence Livermore for quantum circuit simulation. Uh, and it's been used primarily by us so far for uh, kind of implementing uh, in really new ways, different, type of, different types of parallel graph algorithms. So we've considered uh, shortest paths between a centrality and minimal spanning trees so far. Um, so what Cyclops provides is this standard by now kind of tensor algebra in some way of specifying uh, summations and contractions of tensors uh, of two or more. Um, and it, uh, I, I won't really talk in too much detail about uh, all of the functionality that's provided and how things work. There's kind of a number of papers that describe uh, different aspects of this. Uh, but uh, in essence, the best algorithm, so 
each tensor starts as distributed in a particular processor grid that's automatically selected or can be provided by the user. And when two tensors are contracted, uh, the best choice of processor grid to contract them on is found by uh, means of uh, runtime models. So uh, by cost models that, that are evaluated at runtime and tuned offline. Uh, and then the tensors are redistributed and there's a number of redistribution kernels that uh, are involved to achieve this and then contracted uh, using an efficient match multiplication like uh, algorithm. Uh, so there's also a, a large number of functions for just kind of accessing tensors uh, and man manipulating them in various other ways. In particular, we support much of what NumPy and DRA supports uh, and we have a complete Python interface for all of that. In fact, some, I think we have, we're starting to have a little bit more in Python in terms of functionality than in C++ because it's faster to add it. Um, we, uh, to achieve threading, we use OpenMP. Um, so this allows you to get somewhat more performance than just purely using MPI. And we have GPU acceleration, although at this point, primarily just for the dense contractions. For sparse, where uh, we have kind of directions in mind or are actively working toward them. Um, and we also provide an interface to numerical linear algebra routines such as SVD. Uh, and in fact, we have some, some special functionality for uh, things like doing SVDs of slices of an order three tensor. Um, but uh, right, and so that's all I'll say about CTF. For more, please refer to kind of the website and references there, uh, or uh, feel free to reach out to ask me. Um, Next, I want to talk a little bit about tensor decompositions, uh, which are useful for quantum chemistry and have been uh, a subject that our, our group has been working on uh, extensively uh, uh, over, over the past uh, years. Um, perhaps the most important tensor decomposition is the canonical polyadic or the CP decomposition, which expresses a tensor as a sum of tensor products of vectors, which we can rewrite in terms of three factor matrices in this form. Uh, and so this R here is the rank of the decomposition. Uh, and generally this can exceed the dimension. Um, so because we're expressing things in terms of a low order object. So CP decomposition is used in a wide array of applications uh, and is kind of, of also of theoretical interest uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, within quantum chemistry, one place, is that, one place that arises is the tensor hypercontraction factorization, which is something that's applied to the ERI tensor after you compute uh, by density fitting or Cholesky decomposition, it's factorization. Then given this third order intermediate, one can apply a tensor hypercontraction uh, factorization, which is uh, essentially exactly a CPD composition, where you also enforce that one of the factors is the same. And that can readily be supported by a lot of uh, CPD composition uh, approximation algorithms. Um, and of course, we're interested in this setting and many other settings in an approximate CPD composition of the tensor, and we would like the approximation to be as good as possible. Um, with such a factorization, uh, one can uh, argue that if you also apply it to other quantities involved uh, within a couple cluster, uh, the scaling is can be reduced by polynomial orders. And t this type of uh, method can also be applied to other quantum chemistry applications. And I think kind of tensor decompositions also show up elsewhere as well. Um, a different type of tensor decomposition that's quite important is uh, known as Tucker, which uh, also has this core tensor and, a, and one can think of as a, um, as a generalized CP decomposition in a sense that CP forces the score tensor to be a diagonal one. So here we're taking other um, kind of tensor products of different combinations of vectors involved in the same three factor matrices. But I think I, I will not talk about Tucker too much, so let me go ahead. Uh, I wanted to briefly summarize some of the work our group has done in this area, since uh, I think it's perhaps not all, the specifics may not be that interesting for, the, for this audience, but it's, it is good to be perhaps aware that these methods exist for users of tensor decompositions. So uh, we've one thing we've shown, and we've specifically also thought about, uh, kind of test this on tensors that uh, arise in quantum chemistry systems, uh, is whether one should use general optimization methods such as Gauss-Newton for this kind of nonlinear uh, least squares problem, or uh, alternating least squares, which is more or less the standard method that most people use. And we've actually shown that Gauss-Newton can, in some cases, including for kind of a quantum chemistry example, be a lot more accurate. So it actually arrives at a better approximation. Um, We've also thought about how to actually accelerate the alternating least squares algorithm, and we've proposed a way to do that that's based uh, kind of on a, a perturbative uh, expansion of the update. Um, and we've also shown that this is efficient in parallel and outperforms other uh, existing implementations. Uh, and we've shown that with randomized uh, methods, we can reduce the cost of uh, ALS uh, within uh, Tucker 
And uh, with the method, we actually can then use Tucker to compute a CP decomposition. That's one of uh, that's a good way to compute a CP decomposition if the rank is quite small. Um, but I will not go in, into more details about these works. Um, so, in the interest of time, since I think I'm already at 25 minutes, uh, let me not talk about tensor completion. Um, here, really, I wanted to talk more about our takeaways from tensor completion. Tensor completion is kind of a uh, somewhat uh, more complicated version of CPD composition, where we're kind of interested in using a CPD composition as a model for a, a subset of entries that have been observed from the tensor. Uh, the resulting equations to compute the method, to compute something like alternating least squares, so where you alternate between factors to optimize them, um, are a bit more complicated uh, and have, has, have led us to, in a sense, have to innovate as part of uh, uh, the Cyclops library. Uh, in particular, what one observes in trying to implement such methods is that it, if you're working with sparse tensors, uh, it's not really good enough in many contexts to just contract uh, a tensor with a tensor at a time. You actually want to work with more than two tensors as operands at a time. Uh, in a sense, uh, a sparse tensor may be sparsifying the product that you will take with other tensors. So you need to, uh, as a result, design not just routines that contract two tensors, which is what Cyclops is primarily based on, but also routines to, to consider many tensors at once. Uh, this is, to a degree, kind of well known in the uh, tensor decomposition community. And there, the, there's these kind of long acronyms such as MTTKRP, uh, TTTP, TTMC, which refer to different tensor, tensor, tensor uh, contraction type of kernels that are important for uh, some of the most important tensor decomposition algorithms. So TTMC arises very naturally in Tucker decomposition. MTTKRP is ubiquitous in CP decomposition algorithms. Uh, TTTP is something we needed in order to implement tensor completion efficiently. Uh, what, so what we're working towards is also a general implementation of uh, uh, multi-tensor contraction for uh, distributed memory, uh, having in mind uh, sparse tensor applications. We also think that this may be a viable way to uh, use GPUs for sparse tensor contractions, because things like MTTKRP are actually uh, quite computationally efficient and require relatively little distributed memory communication. Um, while if you contract two sparse tensors, you get a, essentially a sparse matrix, sparse matrix multiply, and it's actually quite difficult to get that to be scalable and uh, efficient in terms of indexing overheads. Um, one also finds that in applications like tensor completion, you not only want to contract a set of tensors, you actually want to kind of contract a subset of them, you use that subset to form a small uh, linear system, solve that linear system, and put the result into a new tensor. So you kind of want to solve small linear systems on the fly. Uh, and this is something that actually comes up also in applications in quantum chemistry. Specifically, if you look at state-of-the-art methods for density fitting, uh, the quasi-robust density fitting method is setting up a set of linear least squares problems and solving them by kind of small QR decompositions in a way that uh, seems practically identical to what we have with tensor completion. So we're working also toward uh, applying our method, uh, our kind of multi-tensor kernels uh, to this application in quantum chemistry. Um, that's most of what I wanted to talk about. And let me briefly mention that uh, we've also developed an automatic differentiation, uh, differentiation engine, uh, which is targeted at tensor computations, uh, especially for uh, kind of higher order optimization. So for things like a Newton's method on a set of tensor equations. Uh, the issue with existing tools, uh, it would seem that you know things like JAX and TensorFlow should have had things covered for AD since they're targeted at tensors. But it turns out that because they are uh, primarily interested in kind of first order optimization for deep learning, they're, they're primarily basing all computations on Jacobian vector products. And sometimes it's actually more efficient to just compute the full Jacobian in the sense to form the Hessian. Uh, and they don't really understand tensor algebra identity, such as the distributivity of the inverse over the Kronecker product. Um, so uh, uh, Linjin and Jayu have kind of uh, implemented uh, both uh, an AD engine and a uh, optimization engine for tensor expressions as part of Autohoot, automatic high order optimization for tensors, uh, which has as backend Cyclops uh, TensorFlow for GPU execution, as well as pure NumPy, uh, and can generate code that is competitive uh, with uh, libraries for tensor decompositions, as well as for tensor networks. Uh, we would, would, we're also want to try this for, for AD for quantum chemistry. Uh, and, and I think that if you do something like gradients for a couple of cluster, uh, Autohood, it would be a great choice. Um, so that's all I have to say. For more, uh, uh, here are some links for, to our software. So uh, Cyclops itself, as well as a number of the codes that have used it, which I briefly talked about today, 
uh, are all as part of, can be found at GitHub Cyclops community. Uh, and also Lingen has a separate library for Autohoot, uh, if you're interested in that. Um, and finally, here are some acknowledgements. Um, and thanks again also to the organizers. Thank you, Adam, for the great talk. So we may have time for one quick question if anybody has one. <laughs>